Hello, and welcome to this Analyst Angle. I'm Bob La Liberté, Principal Analyst with The Cube Research. Today, I'm joined by Balaji Prabhakar, co-founder of Clockwork IO, to discuss how innovative software can enable time-sensitive applications, especially in highly distributed environments. Welcome, Balaji. Hello, good morning, uh, Rob. Good to see you here. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't we get started? Um, you know, this technology really caught my eye when I was at Cisco Live earlier this year, and I thought it would be great to share with the Cube Research community. You know, we've seen these modern IT and application environments become highly distributed. We see the applications hosted on, you know, multiple data, multiple private data centers, multiple public clouds, and even edge locations. And you never really know where the users are ac accessing these applications from as well. So I'm wondering, is this sort of the, the same overall environment that you're seeing as well? Yeah, I mean, this has been going on, let's say, since what would be Web 2.0 took off. Yeah. Um, and uh, every, with the, with the advent of smartphones and applications being delivered to users using smartphones, a uh, lot of, and then the rise of cloud computing itself, we've seen this combination of cloud computing and distributed applications delivered to the end users. Um, basically driving pretty much most of the economic applications uh, that we see ranging from banking to entertainment to uh, uh, e-commerce especially. So yes, we've been seeing this same thing. And in fact, the whole world is now living in some uh, form of uh, cloud plus distributed applications. Yeah, absolutely. So to help our viewers out, maybe we could talk a little bit about you know, the problem that you're looking to address, that Clockwork is looking to address with its solution. Yeah, so, you know, um, for 50 years since the advent of the internet or packet switch networking, more specifically, as well as distributed systems that get built on top of such packet switch networks, the design paradigm uh, that drives that, has driven that development is uh, a clockless paradigm. Um, so if you contrast to the circuit switched world or to centralized monolithic computing, um, the first thing that uh, researchers did was to uh, give up on accurate clock sync and to build these systems where agreements uh, are achieved through sort of message passing algorithms and protocols. And uh, that comes uh, with a tremendous ability for scaling, which was the main reason that uh, folks did this. And uh, it does give up some of the performance and that got accentuated over time as we've gone uh, to more and more uh, high-speed networks, the need for accurate timing to enable applications to obtain the best performance they can get has become more paramount. And of course, there are new time sensitive applications, whether that's in uh, financial trading or in uh, gaming uh, or uh, even in uh, recently, let's say, LLM networks, it's uh, very useful to have, uh, it's sometimes not just useful, it's a business imperative, and other times it's rather useful to have very accurate clocks. And that uh, was a starting point for our research, which started at Stanford University, where I'm a professor, and now being commercialized at Clockwork. Got it, got it. So the, the whole concept is that you're putting in a clock sync into these applications and enabling the applications to understand better the latencies and so forth and overcome the latency, the jitter, things of that nature? Correct. If you have accurate clocks, you can measure more accurately the time it takes for a packet uh, to go through a network. And if you can do that accurately, just from the edge of the network, without having to uh, in, you know, rely on the network switches and routers uh, to give you that information of, you can actually measure congestion from the edge then you can control that congestion and therefore run networks which previously were running at 60-70% load before latencies began to really uh, get in the way of application performance. You can rid the networks of that problem, namely you can drive them at higher utilizations while maintaining very low latencies. And I think that's one of the key benefits of synchronizing clocks and by distributed uh, clock synchronization without using again the network uh, and making it uh, scale worldwide, uh, it becomes 
very uh, interesting now to try and look at the multi-cloud, uh, hybrid cloud that deployments that customers have, those who use uh, large-scale networks, and give them the performance that they can get, uh, given the bandwidth that is connecting their different nodes, whether it's in the same data center or across data centers. Absolutely. So it this is it's so fascinating technology. That's why I wanted to to talk to you about it more in, in detail. Um, just out of curiosity, though, where did the idea come from for you to to put this together? Well, the, the initial thought was that if we could measure uh, the time it takes for a packet to go through a network accurately, and then we know this for lots and lots of packets, then maybe we can reconstruct the time it takes for a packet to, uh, to that, how long it's spent at a particular switch. That idea of reconstructing the uh, uh, delays inside a network from uh, just observing and the time it went, a packet went into a time it came out, that, that, that entire thing of looking at just the edge information to reconstruct the, the innards, uh, if you will, uh, is called tomography, network tomography. And the subject has been around since the mid-90s, and that's the starting point for what we wanted to do. And we had an algorithm that could do it, provided the clocks were synchronized. And then we found out in practice the clocks were not very well synchronized, and this led us to uh, looking at clock sync itself. Got it. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. And so really interesting technology, especially for organizations that you had mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of the verticals that would be interested in this, certainly financial industry, gaming industry, things like that, where organizations or, or the users of them are super sensitive to any type of delay or latency that, that all that comes from. I'm wondering if you can maybe also just share with us who is actually using the technology today and provide a few examples of the benefit of deploying the technology into those environments. Sure. So some of the customers we have are from the financial trading industry. So for example, NASDAQ is in a few market participants, those who trade uh, on financial exchanges. And the general idea in uh, financial trading, electronic financial trading, and on the high frequency financial trading or algorithmic trading, all of this where machines look at market data coming out of the exchange um, matching engines and make decisions at very high speed and place orders in response to uh, trends in the market data, in response to variations in price. Um, because multiple users are looking, uh, multiple traders are looking at the same data, and they all choose to respond uh, to uh, trading opportunities, it is important to have a um, first come, first serve type service. So if you're a trader and I'm a trader, then if we both observe the same uh, event to which we react, then if uh, you place the trade ahead of me, then you, your trade should be executed ahead of me. Uh, that is simply, uh, fairness requirement. And this is no different than if you and I were contestants on Jeopardy and we both heard the question uh, from the, you know, the, the moderator, and then you press the buzzer first, you get to answer the question first. And so it's very simple fairness. Exactly that is true in gaming. Gamers are looking at a common scene in a multiplayer game, uh, uh, you know, type environment. And if uh, one gamer uh, is reacting with their, you know, uh, handheld device to uh, make a move, uh, then, you know, they should register at the game engine with that move earlier than somebody reacted later. So that's one uh, aspect of time sensitivity that shows up in network environments. The, um, some of the other things are in databases. So databases, uh, when they're distributed, want to have what's called a consistency guarantee that the view of the truth in the in the data uh, held by the, the different nodes of a database, the transaction, uh, you know, um, timestamps and accuracy are about as consistent as they can be made. And in order to do that as well, you uh, you need to have some sort of an accurate clock sync of the different nodes. So those are two examples that stand out. But underneath the hood, uh, again, going back to this, if you had very accurate measurement of latency, 
you could really use uh, network resources much better. That is the other, uh, perhaps a bigger, more pervasive um, application of ClockSync. Got it. Yeah, no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, certainly, we all know from in the financial world, organizations are spending millions and millions of dollars if they can gain any type of an edge on lower latency and getting those trades in faster and so forth. So it sounds like that the, the software and the solution that you've created not only enables maybe faster throughput as well, greater throughput and at faster speeds, but also can be used to ensure fairness as well. So I'm wondering if there's anything from a, a, a regulatory body or things like, I'm sure there's nothing for gaming, but for the financial services, is there anything around there that would have, yeah. this would be an advantage for organizations to use? Yes, th there is this uh, regulatory requirement. It's called MIFID II. Uh, it's a directive uh, in the, uh, for all trading firms who are trading in the European Union. Uh, but essentially, that includes just about every uh, trading firm in the world, um, that they capture market data and uh, post their data, the, the trades they place and the market data they capture uh, with uh, very high accuracy with respect to uh, universal time. And so clock sync is uh, you know, required by regulatory requirements there. Uh, and in the U.S., we have a consolidated audit trail, and uh, but but even so, it, it is more of a business imperative in addition to being a regulatory requirement. And it's not even to do with just uh, the fairness aspect that I mentioned. Uh, it has to do with if I'm a trading firm and I can capture market data from different exchanges as accurately as is possible with respect to a centralized clock. Then, for example, if I'm trading. Uh, two venues, one in New York and one in Singapore or one in Frankfurt, for example, then I could sort of compare the recency of the uh, market information coming from these different locations uh, with respect to a common clock. And that tells me, hey, this has happened recently uh, and I can react to it. Uh, and so you have this other aspect to market uh, data being uh, distributedly emitted different matching engines uh, across the world and the need for a common clock to capture that data. And that sort of thing is critical for uh, trading firms and increasingly, uh, not just with algorithmic trading uh, or you know, high-frequency trading, but just as uh, large language model uh, models have been developed, uh, GPT you know, equivalents, for uh, looking at market data and uh, either making trade recommendations or uh, anything derived, any insights derived from this market data, uh, the need for accurate uh, capture of that data becomes paramount. Got it. All right, so let's think, so love the story, love the fact that you're able to bring all that technology together. What's actually needed to deploy a solution like this? Is there hardware, software, and, and where does it have to be deployed? Right, so so many things are in the cloud, not in a user's control. Maybe you could explore, you know, explain that a little bit to us as well. Yeah, the the deployment happens as a software agent in nodes that need to be uh, synchronized. And again, you know, the 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 big opportunity or the big problem that we started out with was to try and bring in a sense a sense of uh, clock systems. Uh, which then allow us to understand latencies really well, which in turn under, uh, help us come up with new control algorithms for uh, reducing the latency, eliminating it, um, eliminate in the sense you can't get rid of propagation time, but you can get rid of uh, queuing delays. And, and one thing that happens in every network is literally, even as you and I are speaking now, uh, many packets get dropped. Uh, this is just the nature of packet switch networks is that when buffers fill up, uh, they have to drop packets, and they get uh, retransmitted sometimes for live broadcasts. Uh, there's no point in uh, retransmission, but in general, uh, for file transfer and stuff, they get retransmitted. And just by reducing the packet drops and or just eliminating them, uh, you can really speed up applications. And so that sort of, uh, you know, is the big uh, advantage. Now, when you install a piece of software like what we have or all these different nodes, the uh, first thing it sets about doing is to synchronize the clocks. 
And after that, uh, and, and what we did there was to take a, a, an edge or you know, a software-centric approach, whereas traditionally, uh, people have looked at synchronizing clocks uh, through the network, that is, use the networks, switches and routers, to first synchronize themselves with respect to a common source of time, and then spread that common source of time to the nodes connected to this network. And by taking the approach purely from the edge, uh, we were contending with a more of a signal processing or an ML type approach where uh, you look at timestamps taken at the edge and try and uh, correct for clock discrepancies. And so it's a software agent, gets installed, and then enables clock sync first and then makes measurements and then uh, sets about controlling uh, traffic in such a way as to eliminate delays and drops. And what kind of what kind of performance enhancement can organizations expect to see on a typical deployment just from being able to refine, like you said, eliminating some of those drops, and et cetera, and, and the latency? So many organizations think of some, you know, real-time app like, uh, you know, Airbnb or, or Uber or any, any modern banking application. Uh, they all have a, um, a performance target that if a user makes a request, uh, interacts with my system, uh, that is you press a button saying transfer the money in your uh, uh, mobile banking app, uh, the expectation is that that'll be satisfied uh, in no more than 250 milliseconds. Now it's possible that when you're doing this interaction with uh, the uh, front-end servers uh, or the front-end applications of your bank or any of the other e-commerce type sites that you're on, uh, that they have backend traffic like you know file transfers, uh, storage servers, moving data, logs being written into databases, and those are big and bulky. And the competition between latency-sensitive uh, user-facing application traffic competing on the same pipes with this more bandwidth-intensive background traffic, so what's called the east-west traffic in, in networking parlance versus the north-south traffic. North-south is latency-sensitive user-facing, East West is an internal movement of data. And that competition on a common network usually means that the user facing traffic gets hurt. Now, in terms of performance uh, numbers, this 250 millisecond service level objective can get seriously violated. So we've seen uh, P99 uh, times uh, the 99 percentile uh, as high as a few seconds. And this leads to user abandonment. Uh, it, it is just a serious hit on the business. Uh, and, uh, for the companies in question. So they spend a fair amount of effort trying to get that down. And so that's one where users are there. Uh, of course, there's consistency in databases, which is another key thing. Uh, often, absent accurate clocks, uh, the best consistency guarantees that databases have, give, uh, have given over the years is what's called weak consistency. But if you have accurately synchronized clocks, you can do strong or what's called linearizability. So there, again, the accuracy really changes the game uh, and, the, and the mechanism uh, for doing this is to have some sort of a distributed clock sync. Um, so you can, on the, on the other side, if you really want to have uh, high uh, um, latency guarantees being met, people have typically underrun their network. So if you want, you know, let's say a bandwidth of X, you usually owe provision and have a bandwidth of at least two or three X. And uh, so you sort of said, I'll, I'll throw money at the problem so far. And now with more intelligent software and technology, uh, you can save that. And that uh, saves a tremendous amount of cost. So this could be something like the work of 100 VMs could be done by 70 VMs, right? So you don't have to keep scaling to keep your uh, performance well uh, at an acceptably good level. Yeah, no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. If you're able to, and we've seen this many times, right? How do you how do you solve a problem? Well, you just buy more. Uh, yeah, even even though <laughs> that may not be the best, certainly not best for your wallet, and uh, and may not even improve the performance all that much. So it it sounds like you've you've come up with a solution to enable a smarter, more effective, more efficient way to be able to look at that connectivity between these applications and ensure that you're getting the the fastest performance, the least amount of congestion between those applications and the users or other nodes that are accessing. Correct. And I think, I think that's the key point here. That is, 
um, you know, the, historically, the guarantee that networks have made is what's called, what's been called best effort, uh, which is basically I'm not accountable for anything. I will try my best. And that's been good enough. Um, and whenever we were running into trouble, we've always, uh, you know, 10x or at least double the bandwidth. And so uh, we've sort of paid our way out of this. Uh, and again, commoditization has made networking, uh, network equipment and stuff uh, cheaper. Yep. Uh, you know, engineering efficiencies have kept uh, us afloat. Now, uh, it, it's getting to the point where there just isn't enough uh, space in data centers. There isn't enough um, um, power in a lot of places, for example, in the LLM world. And there you really want to be going after all the bandwidth you can get. Absolutely. You know, and I think the other interesting piece of this, we, uh, so both the, the Cube Research and in conjunction with uh, ZK Research did some studies recently. And one of the data points came up that over nine out of 10 organizations came back and said, the network is, is much more important to us in achieving our business goals. So I think it's great that there's that recognition in these highly distributed environments that the biz, that the network is going to be important for them to achieve their business goals. And it sounds like the solution that you've come up with is something that can ensure that the network is going to be performant and operating as efficiently and effectively as it possibly can for those applications. Absolutely. I mean, the, the key point here is the way, you know, you, you're, the folks you saw it might have actually more recently uh, been uh, saying this, let's say, more emphatically. And what's changed is that previously, you know, companies had their own data centers. Uh, and where, when you own the network yourself and, you know, all the servers are within, let's say, a building or two, uh, you can um, manage your own fate and destiny fairly well, meaning you can get the best performance you can get out of these kind of systems. But increasingly, uh, many organizations, especially in say, almost all the Fortune 500 type companies, have some hybrid deployments, meaning uh, part of the fleet's on premises, which they control, and part of it's in the cloud. And when you have this sort of a dual uh, split, uh, you have different administrators uh, in, in, a, in a more fundamental way. Uh, in the cloud, uh, a tenant is not able to access the hardware uh, freely, and, and uh, you know it's subject to some uh, the, uh, how the cloud operator has configured the network, so you don't really get uh, a lot of uh, you know freedom, and certainly you don't get a lot of visibility. And there, it helps when from the edge, namely from your own virtual machines, uh, you can manage your the connectivity between your nodes and get the best performance you can get out of those nodes uh, without having to rely on uh, the the cloud operator, you know, helping you. Yeah. And, and, and also going over the wide area internet, connecting these different pieces of your fleet uh, is another thing that, you know, you want to negotiate and manage successfully. The wide area links tend to be very expensive as well. So people are very conscious of uh, keeping the burn on those low. So you really want to get the best performance from them. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. This has been a, a great uh, conversation. I've really enjoyed it and I hope everyone else is as well. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. So thank you, Balaji, for uh, joining me. Thank you, uh, Bob. It's been really wonderful talking to you. Absolutely. And I want to thank everyone who's watching this analyst angle on uh, enabling time-sensitive applications and distributed environments. For more information on the Clockwork I.O. solutions, please make sure you visit their website.